Good morning. morning. It's good to see you all here today. It's a beautifully uh, comfortable day, I think. Uh, A a good day uh, at the beginning, almost the beginning of summer. I'd also like to welcome the folks who are tuned into the broadcast uh, this Sunday morning or perhaps uh, later in the week. It's good that you can be with us electronically too. And if uh, circumstances for you change, we'd, we'd be quite happy to have you here in the building as well. But we're in that long season of the church year, the Sundays after Pentecost. We'll continue this season until November. And we're back to an orderly reading of the Gospel of Matthew. I'll say more about that in my sermon today. But we're using now the feast, so the liturgy is not in the red book, but in a little white booklet that you should have received with your bulletin. Might be tucked inside your bulletin, yeah. And so the, uh, the bulletin right-hand edge gives you page numbers to that booklet as we worship this morning. Also, I suppose this is more a greeting than an announcement. Uh, We just received news, my wife and I, uh, about two weeks ago, that her first cousin, Bodan, from Ukraine, is coming to Canada for a while uh, with his daughter. I think in part to get away from uh, things in Ukraine, but also to earn a little bit bit of money uh, to take back home with him again. So we're, we're expecting them to arrive tomorrow. Uh, after uh, uh, an arrangement, uh, I think, with the uh, government, uh, we uh, expect them to be at our house for the summer. And uh, once they're here, we'll introduce you. Uh, and uh, if there's uh, carpentry work or uh, housekeeping work or other kinds of things you'd, you'd like to have some help with, uh, they'd be eager to, to serve you. So we'll say more to you once we, once we know a little bit more ourselves. But let's, uh, let's uh, begin worship. Let's enter into worship with the opening hymn today. It's number 858 in the back part of that red book. I think we stand to sing.
Please be seated again for just a moment. I missed something. Alvin doesn't trust my handwriting, and he, uh, he's the one who reads the names and prayers. So along with those that you've listed in the book already, are there any other persons you'd like us to pray for today? Marie France and Mallory, daughter Mallory. <laughs> okay. Okay. The first one is Ma Maggie France. Maggie. Mary France. Oh, Mary France. First angle of love. <laughs> and the next one? Mallory. Mallory. Who? Babita. Babita. Okay. Jordan and who? Paula. Paula? Okay. And then Jordan. Jordan. Adonna, I'm sorry. Yours was Jordan. Okay. Adonna? Donald. Donald. Oh, Donald. Okay. Any more? Yeah. Alexandra. Any other? Okay. All right. <coughs> We're on page two of Now the Feast. Please stand. Near the bottom of that page. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O God, you are the source of life and the ground of our being. By the power of your Spirit, bring healing to this wounded world and raise us to the new life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. is coming forward, I'll remind you to fill in the worship uh, leader's schedule for the summer uh, so that we always have readers and other helpers in worship uh, these months. Thank God. It's a good letter. So the re first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. God call of Abraham and Sarai has a clear purpose that through them all the families of the earth would gain a blessing. As they set out on their journey, they were accompanied by promises of land, nation, and a great reputation. As they journeyed, they inaugurate sacrificial worship at every stopping point. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brothers Lot's son, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, then the Lord appeared to, Ab to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward Negev. Word of God, word of life. Amen. We'll chant responsively a portion of Psalm 31. I've got the regular type. You've got the sections in bold. We change notes in that little, uh, where you see the little slash. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous. Praise is fitting for the upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make music for God with a ten-string heart. Sing for the Lord a new song. Play your instruments skillfully with joyful sounds. For your word, O oh Lord, is right, and faithful are all your words. You love righteousness and justice. Your steadfast love fills the whole earth. Gather up the waters of the ocean as in a water skin, and store up the depths of the sea. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all who dwell in the world stand in awe. For God spoke, and it came. 
came to pass, God commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord brings the will of the nations to nothing, and thwarts the designs of the peoples. Your will, O Lord, stands fast forever, and the designs of your heart from age to age. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Happy the people chosen to be God's heritage. So the second reading is from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. Paul presents Abraham as a living model of right relationships. For Abraham and for us, a right relationship with God involves trusting that God's promises will be fulfilled because God makes the dead alive and calls into existence what otherwise does not exist. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace, and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the, to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the fate of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the, of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distress made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus Christ our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. 
And as they sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with the disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that region. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace, to you, o Grace mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I should mention to you before I begin that in the Old Testament reading that Nalita read for us, we, we met Abram, literally his name is Father, and after that encounter with God, his name changes. It becomes Abraham uh, that we heard about in the second reading. Abraham means father of many nations. Uh, so, uh, so that's that. Th those characters were the same person, before and after their their encounter with God. We experience the same kind of disruption every year. We begin a new church year and a new lectionary cycle every Advent. Matthew in this year A, Mark in year B, Luke in year C. We hear more stories from those sources in the season of Epiphany after Christmas. We hear about the early stages of Jesus' ministry. But then different bits and pieces from closer to the end of those accounts in Lent and Easter along with passages from John, we hear stories over 13 weeks that uh, take us out of the pattern. So that now... After the feasts of Pentecost and Holy Trinity, we return to an ordered reading of this year's featured gospel. And we're going to keep that up until the end of the church year in November. Thanksgiving, Reformation, and all saints accepted. So let me remind you again this morning of what to listen for as we read from the first book of the New Testament. Paul's letters are probably the oldest books of the Greek Bible. They were written about a generation after Jesus' death as he traveled through Asia Minor and into Greece. The Gospel of Mark took shape a generation after that, written at about the time that Herod's great temple was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. Matthew's account follows another generation after that, perhaps after Judaism and Christianity had parted ways in the year 90. 
We often call the writer of this book Matthew, meaning the tax collector in today's reading. But in the Greek, the book is called after or according to Matthew. And most scholars believe that the unnamed writer claims the disciple as one of his primary sources. I say that because by the year 90, Matthew himself was almost certainly dead. Church legend and tradition suggesting that in Ethiopia, he was staked to the ground, he was speared to death for questioning the morals of the king sometime in the 60s. We know today that the author of this first book of the New Testament also relied on the Gospel of Mark and a document shared with Luke, sometimes called Q or Quella. So Mark gives Matthew his outline, his, his basic timeline. Q adds a little more detail, including the Lord's Prayer. And then the Apostle Paul may have given us the stories in this book that are unique, that aren't far, found anywhere else in the Bible. Like Matthew's version of the story of Jesus' conception and the angel's visit to his human father, Joseph. Then his birth at his home in Bethlehem and the veneration of the Magi with their precious gifts. In Matthew, there are five great discourses, speeches, including the Sermon on the Mount. Then closer to the end, there's the note of a Jewish conspiracy concerning the placement of Jesus' body after its burial. And then the man or men at Jesus' tomb in Mark and in Luke, who in Matthew become angels. And finally, Jesus' farewell blessing to the, to the uh, disciples in Galilee before he is received into heaven. This ancient document was likely prepared for an audience of Jewish people living in Galilee, in the region today we might call Lebanon and Syria. They were not proper Jews of Judea and Jerusalem, but those of the diaspora, scattered across the Mediterranean world. They knew many of the stories and practices of their faith, but they were more familiar with Greek than with Hebrew, these so-called Hellenized Jews. And the writer, perhaps with the tax collector's help, still hoped that after the Council of Jamnia, where Christians were banned from meeting in synagogues and Jews were no longer welcome at Christian gatherings, that Jews might yet be convinced that Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah. This is the hope that Matthew holds out. So he writes to this, this Jewish audience. He describes Jesus often as a king from the line of David, but only better, hence offered the gold by the Magi. Matthew also portrays our Lord as a great high priest for whom frankincense was a fitting gift. And the Gospel of Matthew tells us, too, that Jesus is a prophet, surpassing even Moses and Elijah in wisdom and in courage. The gift of myrrh sounding a somber note about the suffering that he will eventually endure. So while Mark often tells us that Jesus identified himself as the Son of Man, a rather humble term, Matthew introduces him to readers in loftier terms. For example, at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks from his seat on the top of that small mountain in Galilee. He speaks to the crowd below, offering him the Beatitudes and his own commentary on the Ten Commandments. He's being portrayed like Moses atop Mount Sinai. And in the parables, as he tells us about God, the Almighty is often cast in Matthew in the role of a king. Not just a leader, but a king. And Jesus as God's faithful servant. In Matthew, we'll see this summer, there's much less here about the humanity of Jesus. 
the kind of thing we read often in Mark, and much less, too, of the humility that is the cornerstone of Luke's account. The writer of Matthew, more than anything else, wants us to know that God is great and God is good and that Jesus is God's great and good son. This is the message in Matthew. But in the end, as often happens, the writer begins to run out of patience with his own people. His parables, Jesus' parables, that is, and other teachings become increasingly sharp. Matthew begins to say to folks uh, as Jesus' death approaches that a choice needs to be made soon. For example, we read in Matthew's version of that parable of the great banquet that God is going to send servants to kill those who will not accept his invitation. It's much harsher than the account in Mark and in Luke. For the hopefulness and open-mindedness of Mark and Luke for lost sinners, like the prodigal son that might one day be restored, uh, that's not a feature we're going to find in Matthew. Matthew says eventually, after being open for so long, the door is going to be closed. But not as I've said before, God has invited uh, and welcomed sinners. God has proclaimed uh, grace through Jesus Christ. So let me add, in addition to those comments about Matthew, two other quick notes. Uh, sometimes on Sunday mornings for the lessons, there's too little for pastors to work with. We struggle to find a theme. This summer, there's too much. Along with these readings from Matthew that we'll be following from time to time, there's a series of readings we're beginning today uh, of the story of Abram or Abraham. We heard God's call today, and we're going to follow him, and then his son Isaac and his son Jacob and even Joseph in, in Egypt. So listen to those stories as they're read. And know that eventually I'll, I'll connect us to those stories in another sermon as the summer unfolds. The same is true in the uh, New Testament readings this summer. Paul is writing to the Romans before he gets to visit them in person. And uh, we're going to get a sense of his understanding of who Jesus is and what God's ministry was about, Jesus' ministry was about. So listen to those too. And know that if I don't preach about those lessons on one particular Sunday, I'll be preaching about them on another. And we'll tie those three different themes together. So, so, so pick your favorite, follow that most closely, and sooner or later I'll get to a sermon about the, the one you're, you're most interested in. Amen. And so now by a peace which passes all understanding... Let us keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. 764 is our next hymn.
The response to this prayer, these prayers of intercession, is in your bulletin. Who's got the prayer book? Where did it go? The book with the names for prayers. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. We'll need that one. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for a world in need. Oh, I forgot the creed. That's why everybody's confused. Yeah, that's, right. that's why everybody's confused. I'm sorry about this. We'll get to the prayer in just a moment. The Apostles' Creed. Page 9, I think. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Again, trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for a world in need. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for a world in need. We pray, O oh God, for creation, ten forests and fields, and safeguards all cattle, birds, and wild animals, preserve lakes, rivers, and ocean that sends rain to water the earth, Revive land, recovering from fire and other natural disasters. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the church. Unite us with any on the margins. That the whole world recognize that your mercy is greater than our human capacity to restrict it. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the nations, awaken in our leaders' compassion for people who have too often felt forgotten or neglected, and inspire policy solutions that promote equity and inclusion. Bring peace to Ukraine and relief from the flood waters of the DePave River. God, in your mercy. We pray, O oh God, for all who are in need. Accompany anyone enduring chronic illness, any who suffer in secret, and those grieving a loved one's death. Send healing for all who plead for relief from sickness or pain. Especially, today we pray for Vera, Erica, Dick and Carol, Bob and Helen, Marlo and Daniel, Eric, Joy and Tim, Phil, David and Janet, David and family, Jacqueline, Nalita and family, Brandon, Bradley, Brittany, Brianna, Sebastian, Kathy, Ukrainians affected by kind of boa, Rosemary, Nancy, Manfred, Wilma, Mary, Franz, Malena, Babita and family, Brunette, Nicole, Jordan, Paula, Donald, Alex, Andrea, Carrie, and Mary. <clears throat> God.
God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the eradication of racial hatred. We implore you to cast out the demons of white supremacy that make us believe lies about ourselves and our neighbors. God, in your mercy. We give thanks, O oh God, for Barnabas, for Rosemary, and all the saints. Renew our faith that you can do what you have promised and raise us with all our beloved dead to believe to new life. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive our prayers and answer us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Again, we're learning to exchange the peace uh, as you feel comfortable. You can stay where you are. You can keep to yourself. You can bow, make eye contact. You can shake some hands. You can offer a hug or a kiss. But all of it meant to remind ourselves that God is with us in the midst of whatever's going on in our lives. Christ's peace. Nice piece, huh? In our worship service, this next piece of music we often call an interlude is meant to give you some time to reflect, not to check. A time for us, for you to think about what you've heard so far in worship, uh, maybe reflect on the blessings God has given you that become part of our offering, and even to prepare us for the meal that will soon be shared with us at the table. Enjoy.
in the offertory hymn in those booklets. We're singing hymn 481. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. our duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, who calls us to follow his way of humble service and love. And so with the church on earth, all creation and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. and merciful God, everything is filled with your glory. We give you thanks for your promise and presence, which have sustained the faithful in this and every generation. Above all, we give you thanks for Jesus, born of Mary, who in word and deed announced your gentle rule of justice, reconciliation, and peace. On the night of his betrayal, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink. 
saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his command to love one another, his life and death, his resurrection and his ascension, we pray for his coming again, even as we cry. Jesus Christ, our Savior and our friend. continues we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trials, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Lord's Remember, we substitute verse 2 of the Lamb of God verse for the verse appropriate today. That is the uh, Sundays after Pentecost. You are the bread of life for us all. Christ's table, come, eat what is good.
precious body of our Lord Jesus that has been given for you. This bread is Jesus. bread for it is Christ's body given for you. The precious body of our Lord Jesus has been given for you. This bread is the body of Jesus Christ our Savior given for you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. This bread is Christ's body. This bread is the body of Christ our Savior given for you. This bread is Christ's body.
stand to sing some more? Thanks be to you. the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed. Bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Be seated for the announcements. In addition, to what you have read in the bulletin and the newsletter, here are this week's announcements. Join us in the main hallway after worship for coffee and conversation. Enjoy some refreshment and a friendly chat and help visitors to feel welcome. You can also take home a free loaf of bread our Wednesday evening membership class continues. We meet on Zoom from 7 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. This week, we're looking at the Apostles' Creed and what it tells us about our triune God. The washroom project is nearly completion. We'll soon need the help of several painters. See Pierre over there on the music. Our outreach emphasis in June is Welcome Hall Mission, a service agency at our city core. Help those who live on the streets. Your offering will make the difference between life and death for some of our neighbors. Any other announcements? No other announcements. Okay, then the final hymn of the day, 860. Let's lose a little, as you say. Let's 
see how loose we Lutherans can get. <laughs> Peace, serve the Lord.